Thank you so much for joining us. We hope this ministry has touched you and we'd love to hear your story. So please contact us at stories at edgewaterchurch.com. Also, if you'd like to support this ministry financially, you can go on edgewaterchurch.com and choose the giving button that works best for you. Again, thank you and prepare your hearts for today's message. There is power in story. There's power in story. From ancient days of telling stories around a campfire to the dawn of written word to Netflix, everybody loves a good story. I saw a report uh, this week that last year Netflix took in about $950 million per month. That is just, that is crazy. They have all the money. Um, so, so there are all kinds of different stories, um, lots of different genres. We all have our, our favorites. For me, if it has a superhero or if something explodes, I'll watch it. Um, for my wife, if it has the hallmark symbol in the bottom right corner of the screen, she will watch it. Um, if, if, we could just, if we could just find the movie where, where the, the plot is that the girl comes to, a, to visit in a small town to have a weekend away from her controlling boyfriend, and she meets a nice local young man who eventually rescues her from an accident, and she falls in love, and lo and behold, he can fly. And, and, and the old boyfriend ends up becoming a supervillain and takes the small town hostage, and boom! Best of both worlds, right there, got to tell you. Looking for that movie. But we all have our favorites, different types of movies, different types of stories. Some, some stories can be very inspiring, um, stories about people who overcame the odds to be able to achieve what it was they set their heart and mind on. No matter what difficult situation they faced, they were willing to do whatever it takes to make it through. One of the joys of being a pastor is that I get a front row seat to hear a lot of different stories. Uh, this was a big week for us. Not only did we have the trick-or-treat outreaches on Wednesday, we had a fifth Tuesday service this past Tuesday night, and that was awesome. We baptized 23 people on that night. That was a, that was a great celebration. And at the 11 a.m. service this weekend, at, well, and at the, including the 9.30 service too, then we have nine new people joining as partners in ministry here at Edgewater. And so that is, that's an awesome thing to celebrate. But through all of that, all of those folks involved, there are so many cool stories. And again, as a pastor, I get a chance to, to, to have a window into a, a lot of that sometimes. Some folks got baptized Tuesday night, and they had only been here for two weeks or less. Um, some folks had been away from church for a while and have now made their way back. Some folks have overcome great personal difficulties to get back on the right path. One person rearranged their work so they could spend more time serving God. And I, I, hear, I hear some of your stories, and I'm inspired to be a better person, to, to live better, to serve better, to love better, to follow Jesus better. You, you all inspire me. Stories can motivate us to bring about change in our own lives. And I think that's one of the reasons that God gave us the Bible. I mean, he could have just given us a long list of 642 rules and addendums that we have to live out, working out every day, trying to do that. But instead, he gave us a book that tells stories about how God works. Stories about how to live a life that honors God and blesses others. Stories of people trying hard and still getting it wrong sometimes. Stories of people overcoming incredible difficulties, but learning a lesson and coming out on the other side, better people. Stories of people being willing to do whatever it takes. And of course, stories of Jesus. 
And that's where we're going in this new series called Whatever It Takes. We wanted to take some time to walk through some of the stories of Jesus. We've been talking a lot this year about the importance of, of being a disciple, being a follower of Jesus. And one of the first steps of living that out is simply making your way to Jesus. So, so the stories that we're going to be walking through are stories of people who are willing to do whatever it takes to get to Jesus. And so what I want to do tonight is I want to start in the, uh, the Gospel of Luke. Luke is in the New Testament. That's the second part of the Bible. Um, it, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke. So it's the third book in that second part. Um, it's one of the four books that we call the Gospels. And those, those four books kind of tell the stories of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And so we're going to start tonight in Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 4. Where it says, Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. Let me give you a little bit of, uh, little bit of background here. Um, first of all, this story, the way it kind of fits in the, the story of Jesus is it's kind of, toward, kind of towards the end of Jesus' story. He had already been in ministry for, for many years at this point. He had gone around the region uh, teaching and healing and loving folks for almost three years at this point. Jesus' next stop after being in Jericho would be to go to Jerusalem where he would eventually be put to death. This is the same Jericho that if you remember the story from the Old Testament that the walls of Jericho fell down. This is the same, same city. Um, Jericho is about 18 miles northeast of Jerusalem. Um, and in that day and time, it was a beautiful area. It was one of the wealthier cities in the region. Um, lots of caravans went through there, especially then heading to Jerusalem. Um, so lots of crops, lots of wealth, lots of caravans meant lots of taxes. And, and so it was a great place to be then, especially if you were a tax collector. Um, and that's what Zacchaeus was. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. For those of you who have no idea why we're laughing, um, this was an old Bible school song. Some of you may remember, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. Okay, that's enough. Never mind. Um, for me, that, that story was always a favorite growing up. Um, first of all, it had that really cool song that went with it. Um, but uh, we had an old, an old felt board in my Sunday school class where they could stick pieces of like little figures on there to tell the stories and things like that. And, and everybody always used to fight over who would get to be the one to stick the little Zacchaeus dude in the tree. Um, and so we basically had to go through the story 10 times. So everybody got a chance to put Zacchaeus up in the tree. And um, and then back then, I didn't, I didn't just, I, I didn't put it together when I was little that, that he was just short. I mean, I remember thinking that he was, he was wee. I mean, he was, he was like Ant-Man sized or something. Um, it wasn't until later that I, that I actually learned that he was kind of pretty much just, shall we say, vertically challenged. Um, so Zacchaeus was also a tax collector, we read in the text. Um, now, in our day, I mean, we may not like paying taxes, but, but we don't normally hold grudges against our local tax collector. Um, back in Zacchaeus' day, though, it was very different. Um, Israel was ruled over by the Romans at this point, and uh, they set up a system for um, collecting their taxes, which involved using the local people. And so you could essentially get like a, a tax collecting franchise, basically. Um, and as long as Rome got what they required, you could tax the crud out of folks and you could keep the change. And, and then if people didn't like it, then, then you, the Roman soldiers that were there would force them to pay what it was that you told them to pay. So it was a pretty good racket if you got into that. So because of this then, because they were local people uh, doing this to local people, um, the tax collectors were looked at as traitors to their own people in a lot of cases. But they were protected by the Romans. And so the people were frustrated by and hated the tax collectors. Now, remember earlier then that I said that there was a lot of wealth in Jericho, and Zacchaeus was the chief tax collector in the area, so dude was filthy rich with emphasis on the word filthy, because he got rich by cheating his own people. So, Zacchaeus heard that Jesus was coming to town. Um, even though the internet was really slow back then, Zacchaeus had heard about Jesus, 
And I, I was thinking about it as I was preparing, and I wonder what it was that Zacchaeus heard about Jesus that made him willing to, to go out in public to leave kind of the safety of his office and the protection of his Roman guards to actually go out into public because out of the safety of his office, he was vulnerable. People could throw things at him or grab him and beat him up or since he was a wee little man, they could just tuck him under their arm and run off with him or whatever. I don't know. (laughs) Something about what he had heard about Jesus motivated him to take a risk. Was it the stories of the miracles that Jesus did? Jesus had done some pretty amazing things, bringing people even back from the dead. Maybe it was Jesus' reputation as a, as a good teacher. Maybe he had heard stories of Jesus spending time with and loving those who were outcast from society. Lepers, prostitutes, sinners. And just maybe Jesus could love him too. Whatever, whatever the reason was, Zacchaeus headed out to try to, kept, to ke- catch a glimpse of Jesus. But he was having a hard time seeing Jesus. There was a crowd there. Some, some of his struggle had to do with him because, I mean, he, he was short. He couldn't see over the crowd. Some of the, the difficulties stemmed from just the other people around. There, there were pe- taller people than him all around blocking his view. Some of them might have been throwing some unintentional elbows as he walked by. So what gets in the way of trying to see Jesus? Like Zacchaeus, sometimes it has to do with us. Sometimes it has to do with others. Maybe you feel like you've done too much bad stuff in your life to think that Jesus might want to have anything to do with you. Maybe you've allowed your life to get busy and and overfilled. Maybe your priorities are a little out of whack. Maybe it has to do with others. Maybe you got hurt by a church or by someone who who said they were a Christian. Maybe some of your friends or the people you associate with are are down on religion and and you've let their opinion influence you. There there are lots of things that, that get in the way of us trying to see Jesus. But whatever the case may be, we need to be willing to do whatever it takes. In this case, in this story, Zacchaeus was willing to do something unusual and honestly very undignified for someone of his position. He, he climbed the tree to be able to get to see Jesus. So that was, that's what he needed to do to get to see Jesus. Maybe the first step for you is just the fact that you're here tonight. And, and that's awesome. If this is your first time or you're still relatively new, new here at Edgewater, I'm so glad that you're here, that you've taken this step to get a chance to see Jesus. Maybe, maybe there is a... Um, rearranging of priorities that needs to happen in your life. That's what you need to do to clear out the way to be able to to see Jesus. Maybe there are some activities that you need to begin working into your life on a day-to-day basis to help you seek out Jesus, spending time reading God's word, spending time praying every day. Some of those things that maybe you need to do to, to help you get on that way to see Jesus. But check out what happens next in the story. Luke chapter 19, verse 5. It says, When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, Quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Jesus looked up and called him by name. I love that. I love that. As awful as a person as Zacchaeus had been, Jesus still made a point of calling him by name, and he wanted to connect with him. Now, there are different ways that you can call someone's name. I knew that if my mom called me Dan or Danny, it was okay. But if she called out for Daniel King Prime, I knew I was in store for a whole something else. And I, and I think that, that Jesus calling Zacchaeus by name was more of that first kind. I don't think it was a scolding, hey, you get down from that tree. Jesus was willing to reach out and connect with people no matter who they were or where they were. That's why we hold hospitality at such a high value here at Edgewater. Our Team Orange folks do such a great job extending greeting and warmth and welcome to folks as they come through these doors, whether they've been here for the first time or the hundredth time. But don't forget that all of us are part of Team Orange. 
We're all part of that team. We all need to be a part of the welcoming environment here, extending a greeting to folks that we may or may not know. Again, just a little tip. If, I know a lot of folks don't initiate conversations because they're like, well, I don't want to ask them if it's their first time and they could be here 20 times. Just go, I've never met you before. That's, that's what I've started doing is it just say, I've never met you before. And well, sometimes I'm even wrong then, but still, um, it, it, it's just a good way to, to open that conversation because everyone wants to be greeted. Everyone wants to know that they're welcome, that they, that they fit in, that they're, they're part of what's going on. And so we're all part of that welcome. But all of that springs from the fact that Jesus did it for us first. That he reached out to us when we were far from him. When when I deserved him saying, Daniel King Prime, you get out of that tree. Instead, he said, hey, Dan, I see you. I know who you are. I know what you've done. But I still want to connect with you. I still love you. He did that for us, so we need to be willing to do that for others. Let's look and see what happened next. Verses 6 and 7. So Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy, but the people were displeased. He's gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. So Zacchaeus invited him to his house, but the crowds didn't like that. They thought, man, out of all of the people here gathered today, this whole huge crowd of people here, why would Jesus choose him? He's awful. Why would Jesus pick him? So I, I would imagine that Jesus probably faced some, some social pressure to avoid Zacchaeus. Jesus could have easily just kind of rolled into town and, and hung out with the religious and political leaders, you know, made those connections, and, and the, the crowd probably would have been okay with that because, you know, that would be expected. But Jesus was willing to go against the flow in order to connect with people who needed him. Let's see what kind of impact this had on... I had to... I, was, I got tired of typing Zacchaeus, so now from here on out, I'll just say Z every time in here because I, I just, it's hard to type Zacchaeus many times. So um, let's see what kind of impact this had on Mr. Z here in, uh, in Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 8. It says, Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord, and if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Wow. What, what, a, what, a, what a turnaround immediately. Zacchaeus gave half of his wealth to the poor and offered to pay back those he had cheated four times as much. This was unprecedented. There were lots of, of course, rules and regulations in those days. And um, if someone then, in this case, who had made his living cheating others was going above and beyond to make things right, his offer of restitution was more than what was legally required. If it was just an ordinary robbery, um, you would have to pay back double what you stole. But if you, if you confessed your wrong and willingly made restitution, you had to pay back the amount that you took uh, plus an, an additional one-fifth more. But Zacchaeus was so impacted by this encounter with Jesus that he was willing to not only give half of his wealth to the poor, but also to pay back four times the amount that he stole. Not just a quick change in the head or change in the heart. This was a life change that was happening right from the very beginning. Zacchaeus made this incredible um, offer. The, the, The change that occurred reached all the way to his wallet. And I'll tell you what, sometimes the last thing to change when we encounter Jesus is our wallet. I'll just leave that there. Um, But Zacchaeus did it right up front. That was like the first thing he did was say, you know, I'm going to pay it back. Because he knew that's where his point of difficulty was, especially then in relationship with all the people, was all the money that he had stolen. So he wanted to make it right, right away. When we have a real encounter with Jesus, when we turn our lives over to him, we should be different. Our lives should look different. We should begin to respond to situations differently. Our life should begin to, to bear fruit. Let's see how the, uh, how the story wraps up. In verses 9 and 10, it says, Jesus responded, Salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. 
Now, if you stop and think about it, this statement would have probably shocked those who were just kind of watching the scene happen. I would imagine that, that, that not only Jesus came to Zacchaeus' house, but there might have been some other people that came, and there might have been some other people just watching what was going on because this was so unusual. And this statement by Jesus probably would have shocked them for a couple of reasons. For some, when they heard Jesus call Zacchaeus a true son of Abraham, they might have thought, no way. This guy is not part of the family anymore. He has cheated his way out of our family. He, he gave up his right to be part of the family when, when he sold out our people. But those who maybe even were gracious enough to still be willing to consider Zacchaeus as part of the family would have been shocked because then they would have said, well, wait, how could one of us be lost? I mean, come on, we're the Jews. We're, we're God's chosen people. We, we can't be lost Except for that one time 40 years in the desert, but we won't bring that up. Um, so, sorry, that just, that just came to mind. Um, here's the thing. I think that part of the message that Jesus is trying to get across is this. You're not saved by a good heritage, and you're not condemned by a bad one. Faith is more important than genealogy. Each of us have to make a decision about what we're going to do with Jesus each of us as an individual. It's our decision alone. You're not saved because grandma went to church or you were raised in a Christian home. It's not, it's not a, a birthright that's passed down. You have to make a decision of what you're going to do with Jesus for yourself because we all have sinned, all as, as individuals, myself certainly included. We have all made mistakes that have separated us from God. But Jesus was willing to do whatever it takes. I love how Jesus laid out his mission statement right there in, in that verse 10, that he came to seek and save those who were lost. Jesus could have come for all sorts of different reasons. Um, he could have come to punish us. He, he could have come to make sure that we, that we maintain good orthodox theology but he came to seek and save those who were lost, like, like me, like you. But the good news in all of this is, is that the lost can be found and made new. If, if something is lost, it's, it's out of the place that it's supposed to be, and it's in the wrong place. When, when we find such a thing, we need to, to, to return it to the place that it should occupy. We're lost when we've, we've wandered away from God, when we don't have God at that center spot in our lives. But then we're found when we make our way back to that place, that place that we were created to be, right smack dab in the arms of Jesus. Jesus. The arms of Jesus, who is the one who is willing to do whatever it takes to be able to restore you and me into, back into relationship with God. Even though, again, we've, we've, we've walked away. We've been in active rebellion against God. We've, we've made our own choices. We've put ourselves in that center spot in our lives. And so we've... We've kind of lost ourselves. But Jesus came to restore it, to bring us back to where we belong. Please pray with me. God, thank you for this time together tonight. I thank you for this love that you have for us, that love, this love that was not content for us to just remain lost. This love that was willing to do whatever it takes to reach out to us, no matter how far we run away, that it just takes that one step to come back because you, you pursue us, you follow us. You reach out to us. And God, for that, we are so grateful. Thank you that you, you haven't given up on us. Even if we end up doing the same wrong thing over and over and over again, you still love us, you still care for us. You want us back. And so, God, I pray that you will help us then to be able to do whatever it takes. To be able to uh, take that step 
back to you, to be able to say yes to that offer of relationship that you extend to us. Whatever step it may be along our journey towards being a disciple that we're ready and willing to do that next thing, whatever it takes, that we won't let anything else take that, that center spot in our lives, but that that's just for you. that we'll rearrange our, our schedules, our priorities, whatever it takes. Maybe you're here today and, and that's the step that you want to take tonight. You, you feel like you're Zacchaeus up in that tree. You, you just showed up here tonight because you, you just desperately want to see Jesus. You know, you know there's something off in life. You may not even know exactly what the answer may be, but you just had a sense that this could be a place that you could find it. Well, you have. And that's through a relationship with Jesus. And so we're gonna, I'm going to encourage you to go ahead and take that step, to come down from that tree Jesus is offering to, to connect with you. And one of the ways that we respond to Jesus' invitation to us around here is to just pray in a simple prayer. So I'm going to pray this out loud, and I invite you to uh, pray it along with me. Just repeat it after me, phrase by phrase. Pray, dear God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sin. Please forgive me of all I've done wrong. Help me to live for you, whatever it takes. In Jesus' name, amen.